Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear Gijs, welcome in the auditorium of Maastricht University for the guests that are here for the first time. We are about to hear the inaugural address of Professor Gijs van Dijk. And it is with great pleasure that I can have the first five minutes to say a few words to you, to a colleague with whom I share a history in Tilburg. So we are both Tilburg uh, colleagues. As you will notice later in my speech, if you didn't already know this, Gijs van Dijk is a fanatic baseball player. Since the age of 10, he has played baseball a few times a week in recent years in Nunen, also a location I know quite well. Now, I don't know much about baseball, I must admit, but I am familiar with the terms first, second and third base, plus the end goal home base. So I came up with the idea of building my speech around four bases. Now, the first base stands for scientific research. And I think it is fair to say that Gijs belongs to the top in his field, the empirical approach to private law. And I've just heard that you had a seminar today about empirical approaches to law with many colleagues, that there are many believers, because 10 years ago, I can tell you, that was definitely not the case. If you would do empirical work in law, you could easily be uh, shouted at at that stage in time. Now, there aren't many who do this work in the Netherlands, so your playing field extends also across national borders. Your research focuses on the behavior of citizens and their responses to legal rules and institutions. And one of your publications this year in the prestigious Oxford Journal of Legal Studies was called The Ordered Apology. Now, the conventional wisdom is that apologies that are claimed or ordered do not serve a purpose because they lack sincerity and violate the right to freedom of expression. Now your article challenges conventional wisdom by demonstrating that apologies do not need to be sincere in order for them to serve a purpose, also in a legal procedure. Now we have a very shared research line, uh, mine focusing on victims of war crimes, and I've also seen how important an apology can be for people who have suffered, in my case, then from crimes. And the enormous importance of acknowledgement that something wrong is a valuable insight that science can offer to society. In addition, you are also a pioneer in the Netherlands in the use of big data in law. You make quantitative empirical analysis of Supreme Court rulings and how they relate to each other. And together with a research engineer, he developed a technology that assists the legal community in analyzing case law. And in this way, which I think is really innovative as well, big data is not only relevant in computer science and life sciences, where we see it quite a lot, but also in legal research. And that brings us to the second base. Now, Gijs, I've been told from your new colleagues in the faculty, is strongly focused on innovation. With his enthusiasm, he easily takes people in new directions. He also approached the courses that he became responsible for when he came here with quite an innovative outlook. The courses in law of obligations and contract law are now more student oriented and students are more challenged to participate. Above all, your colleagues tell me you are a true team player. They also told me that you even train a children's baseball team in your spare time. Your colleagues at the law faculty always know where to find you when, you when they need an innovative team player and often ask you to join innovative work groups and the like. And that brings me to the third base. I have to be shorter. So it's a short summary of your character and work. You bring people together. Since one September, last one September, I mean, you have taken over from Jan Smits as chair of the private law department. He'll have to pull out all the stops, as Jan describes it. But there's no doubt that he is the right man for the job. Gijs is not only very enthusiastic about his environment, innovative, as I already said, thoughtful and reliable, but in Jan's word, he's, he also has the necessary dose of humor 
that is essential in the life of a department chair. Now, I'm not sure if that's good to know because you're still starting, yet starting. Your team mentality can also be seen in your close collaboration with the Department of Knowledge Engineering here at this university, with whom you make these network analysis. So multidisciplinary cooperation is of great importance in your scientific research, actually also firmly embedded within Maastricht University and certainly also in your DNA. And so we end up at your home base. Until recently, that was in Eindhoven. After the train ride to Maastricht, Gijs walked via Wiek to the inner city, packed with his bags full of fruits and sandwiches, because as someone confided to me, he's very slim, but he eats quite a lot. You wouldn't say that, indeed. And very recently, he moved to Maastricht with his wife, Nicole. He lives in a beautiful old house, which is not so difficult here in Maastricht, at the Emmaplein, if I'm informed correctly. All I'm wondering is whether the transfer from Baseball and Soft Club Nune to Baseball and Soft Club Maastricht has already taken place. But I speak from experience when I say that they'll have a great team player with Gijs in their team. Now with José van Dijk, president of the Royal Academy and your aunt, present here today, I recently had the pleasure to drink a cup of coffee at a terrace in Budapest. Uh, and we talked about you. Uh, we talked about your development. And she told me also that your promoter was, uh, who's unfortunately not here, I was just informed, Jan Franke. Uh, uh, so he had to apologize himself. But that your promoter was also the same promoter as your mother, also the sister of José van Dijk. And we also said together to each other in Budapest that your mother would have been so proud of you here today. Now, Gijs, I wish you great success and great pleasure with your research and teaching activities at our university and also a seamless integration already here into the city of Maastricht. And I hope that you score many home runs in science, but also on the baseball field. The floor is yours. The book and movie Moneyball illustrates the revolution that the game of baseball has gone through as a result of the application of statistical data. It describes the story of how the at the time unconventional application of statistical data helped the Oakland Athletics achieve winning seasons in the 1999-2006 period, which led them to reach the playoffs in various years. Finding affordable players was and is uh, a necessity for the athletics as their payroll, the amount they can spend on a yearly basis on player salaries, ranks as one of the lowest of all Major League Baseball teams. Clayton Kershaw, the Los Angeles Dodgers top pitcher, will earn $36 million in 2017, which constitutes almost 44% of Oakland's total payroll. If the Oakland Athletics had Kershaw on their team, they would only have $46 million remaining for the 39 other players on their roster. The athletics needed to find good players at low cost in order to compete. To do this, it started using statistics to find players who are undervalued and consequently more affordable than players targeted by most other teams. Since no other team paid so much attention to certain statistics as the athletics, Oakland pursued players who were not popular with other teams and were sometimes not targeted at all by their competitors. For example, the Athletics selected the, according to them, best hitter in the 2002 draft after other teams had already had 217 opportunities to select the same player. Such players were affordable as there was little demand for them. The Pittsburgh Pirates, like the Oakland Athletics, is a baseball club with severe payroll restrictions, which also started using unconventional metrics to outperform other teams. While the success of the A athletics was mostly the result of use of data of on offense, so scoring runs or points for one's own team, the Pirates turned to defensive metrics, that is, trying to prevent the opposing team to score runs or points. 
Defense in baseball, however, is much more difficult to analyze than offense as player positioning, reach, and movement are difficult to measure. When delving into defensive metrics, the Pirates started challenging defensive positioning of baseball players that has been universally applied by all baseball teams worldwide for more than 100 years. And the normal positioning you can see on the screen. In baseball, only the pitcher and the catcher have fixed positions. The other seven players may be more or less moved around freely, but for years it was uncommon to move players far away from their ordinary positions. The Pirates asked themselves, what if everybody is wrong? What if the positioning that has been common for decades is not the optimal one? Asking the question was legitimate as the team's analytics department found that left-handed hitters were twice as likely to hit the ball to the right side of the field, as indicated within the, uh, the circle, than to the center or the left side of the field. According to the analytics department, the Pirates' defense should shift for 25% of all hitters. Consequently, the Pirates started positioning or shifting their defense. If you compare the picture on the left with the two pictures on the right, you clearly see a difference of where the players are positioned here. The dramatic 370% increase in shifts from 2012 to 2013 resulted in the Pirates adding 6% more wins in a single season without increased spending. The title of this lecture, Money Law and Beyond, covers two topics. While Moneyball describes the rise of analytical tools to assess player performance in the field of baseball, Money Law refers to the integration of analytical tools in law and legal research, including artificial intelligence and empirical research in general. This is the first topic of this lecture. Money Law also refers to the dominant focus of the monetary perspective in tort law and presumably other, other areas of the law. This is the second topic of this lecture. The and beyond part of money law and beyond captures the quest for possible solutions and the challenges that the law, tort law in particular, faces to overcome the monetary perspective. The result of all this, this lecture, will be a research agenda. Which avenues can be explored to create money law, the integration of law, empirics, and technology? and how to go beyond the monetary focus. The legal field is also being transformed, as analytics, just as in baseball, is on the rise in the legal domain. I will illustrate this with a project that was conducted with the eSign Center, whereby a tool was developed which visualizes relationships between court decisions and which uses algorithms and programming code to determine which decisions belong together because they deal with similar topics, and to determine which precedents are the most authoritative. The tool was used to analyze Dutch case law and to identify relevant clusters of decisions on a number of topics, including employer's liability, director's liability, and standard terms. In the example on director, uh, employer's liability, several large, large clusters can be discerned, each of which is on the slide represented with a specific color. And on the slide, you see the topics of duty of care, harm during work activities, and causalities, which topics connects quite well to the topics identified in legal literature. The technology also makes it possible to identify authoritative precedents within each cluster. Determining what the authoritative precedents for employer's liability are, the tool makes it possible to generate lists. The overview produced by the technology mostly, also mostly coincides with the important precedents identified in doctrinal research. It is now even possible for users of this technology to construct their own data set, not only for decisions of the Dutch Supreme Court, but also for case law of lower courts. And as you can see, building a data set is quite intuitive, at least for legal scholars, which means that every legal researcher and law student can start using the tool. And actually, some of my master students are already doing this. The technology that was built and the metrics that were used are based on network analysis. Network analysis essentially allows mapping, measuring, and possibly visualizing relationships between, for instance, individuals, groups, or information. In social networks, network analysis can be used to detect the most popular person in a network. 
Those who, for example, receive more messages from other individuals in the network may be perceived as more, po more popular persons than those who hardly receive any messages from others. Network analysis relies on two key measures, nodes and edges. The nodes can be individuals, groups, or information, whereas the edges link the nodes. The idea behind network analysis is similar to the concept of precedent, which can be defined as the practice of using a rule set in a prior legal case to decide subsequent cases. Treating court decisions as nodes and court citations as edges allows the creation of a precedent network which allows the identification of important precedents. Decisions which are decided more frequently are presumed to be more important than decisions that are cited less frequently. Network analysis in law has the potential to transform how case law is analyzed. Importantly, it has the potential to accelerate search processes when identifying clusters of case law topics and to identify relevant cases within those clusters. Furthermore, relating network measures to particular years allows to look at how cases have become important over time and to possibly predict which cases will become relevant. Consequently, network analysis promises to be a valuable addition to classical doctrinal analysis of the law. Despite its promises, network analysis also has limitations and challenges. Citation analysis relies on citations, which means that all decisions are, by definition, more likely to be deemed important than more recent decisions, and that very recent decisions may be overlooked. Furthermore, network analysis provides information on how decisions relate, but not on why decisions relate. This is why network analysis cannot and should not completely replace the reading and interpretation of case law and the doctrinal analysis of law. Another limitation concerns the quality of the citations. Judges may cite other decisions as a matter of courtesy to add authority for the interpretation for, or of a rule of solving a case or to distinguish the case at hand from other cases. Moreover, courts may cite previous case law to indicate that they embrace the rules laid out in a previous case, a positive citation, or are departing from them, a negative citation. As a result, not every citation should be given the same way. Treating citations differently depending on the type of citation will become even more relevant when network analysis includes different types of citations. For example, citations coming from legislation, legislative memoranda, case law, and scholarly work. Legal analytics and network analysis in particular can be considered to be part of the family of empirical legal research, which is defined here as research conducted on a legal topic by means of applying methods and techniques that are commonly used in the social sciences. Network analysis adds to the diversity of empirical legal research, which has mostly relied on case study research, interview studies, and questionnaire research by means of descriptive analysis, regression analysis, and other types of univariate and multivariate analysis. Empirical research can be used for various purposes. And in one of my archives, I found a very interesting purpose, which is a propaganda purpose, because when you look at the figures of problem-based learning at the former Rijksuniversiteit Limburg, you clearly see that the problem-based learning method outperforms the other methods taught at other universities. On a more serious note, empirical legal research has been applied to systematically describe and explain legal phenomena to test and demystify assumptions, to evaluate laws, rules, and practices, and to test intended reforms prior to their enactment. Many examples can be used to illustrate the purposes for which empirical research can be deployed, but due to time constraints, I will discuss only one. And more can be found in the paper version. Uh, you will get uh, one of the versions after this lecture. A recently conducted study on a procedure for victims of sexual abuse by the Catholic Church, priest abuse, aimed to analyze when and why non-monetary relief was ordered by the adjudicators or decision makers or judges. The adjudicators in this procedure took the opportunity to provide various types of non-monetary relief in addition to granting the complaint. For example, they would order the church or the accused to, among other things, provide an apology 
to recognize the victim's suffering or to acknowledge the abuse. It was surprising to discover a substantial drop in the percentage of decisions in which the adjudicators recommended non-monetary relief in the 2013-2014 period, as you can see on the screen. In this period, the percentage of decisions that included some type of non-monetary relief, like an apology, went down from 59% to a staggering 11%. No immediate explanation was available for this sudden drop. The last resort was to turn to the panel members. Did the drop coincide with adjudicators entering or leaving the panel? When looking for adjudicators who entered the panel or left the panel around the same time as the drop, it was found that six panel members entered the panel or left the panel during this period. As you can see on the screen, on the lower figure you see the adjudicators who entered the panel in that period, and in the middle figure you see the adjudicators who left the panel in the same period of the drop, which is displayed in the top figure. Logistic regression analysis was conducted to determine whether the relationship between the drop and non-monetary relief and the presence or absence of certain panel members was likely to be coincidental. The analysis adjusted for other possible influences, variables, such as case strength, the gender of the victim, and whether the victim had already obtained non-monetary relief provided by the church or accused prior to the decision. The impact that some of the panel members had is remarkable. The presence of one particular adjudicator out of a pool of 27 would make it six times more likely that non-monetary relief would be recommended to com compared to when this adjudicator was not a panel member. Substantial effects were also found for four of the other five panelists, although the impact of their presence was much lower than the impact of that one panelist. The results raised interesting, raise the interesting question of how the practices of the panelists differed and which practices were successful at addressing non-monetary needs. We'll come back to this later. This is not to deny the importance of monetary compensation. In addition to positive psychological effects, various studies support the notion that monetary compensation is crucial in many instances, particularly in situations where the, unjust, uh, in situations where the injustice that the victim suffered affected or endangers his financial security. If your house burns as a result of a wrong of another person, you want to be compensated so you can rebuild your house. In contemporary tort law, oh, um, hold on. Yeah, there we go. In contemporary tort law, monetary compensation is extremely important. In fact, it is the alpha and omega of tort law. Concepts as compensation and damages are commonly understood in, non in monetary terms. For example, the principles of European tort law state that damages are a money payment to the victim, to compensate the victim. And the practice directions in Article 41 mention three types of just satisfaction, pecuniary damages, non-pecuniary damages, and costs and expenses. Given the positive effects of non-monetary needs, it is not surprising that the monetary perspective is criticized. As a victim who obtained damages after being wronged by another person stated, I don't feel validated because I got a few bucks. I haven't gotten a real letter of apology. Torch Law's focus on repairing harm and losses by means of monetary compensation has important limitations. In his book, Sandel provides striking examples of the shortcomings of the dominance of monetary compensation. To illustrate this, he refers to how people can cut lines by paying for a more expensive airline ticket, we all know how that works, or by paying another person, a line stander, to stand in line for him. A market has even emerged for those who want to visit the US Congress in Washington DC or New York City's public theater Shakespeare performance without having to stand in line. And as you can see, there's a company who says to specialize in United States congressional hearings and to produce high quality line standing. The main problem in the line standing example is that the monetary perspective crowds out other values or even supplants them. 
the moral norm of having to wait for your turn is replaced by considerations of costs and benefits. How much am I willing to spend to cut this line? Monetary compensation works well in instances where there are no other values at stake or where the same measure can be used to determine the value of something. This is the case when determining what should be awarded to a victim whose cell phone is damaged by another person. In this instance, the loss, damage to the cell phone, and the compensation, payment for the repair, can be assessed by the same measure, money. However, monetary compensation does not work well in situations of personal injury, as living a healthy life is generally not measured or valued by means of money. Some do, but you will find more information on that in the book. Even though equating value to money can be helpful in a variety of circumstances and for various purposes, issues arise when the money perspective conflicts with other values. The monetary perspective as a sole value is then problematic, as the reduction of values to the single measure of price exclude other value domains that, following those values, justify other outcomes than the monetary perspective does. For instance, it is morally difficult to choose between investing 10 million in road safety to save 16, 16 lives or to invest 15 million to save 12 lives. The issue here is that such trade-offs are taboo trade-offs. Trade-offs of conflicting values that are incommensurable with the incommensurability consisting of values that are incomparable or of values where one value is not better than the other value. Incommensurability is also an issue when awarding damages in tort law, particularly when non-pecuniary damages are awarded to remedy non-monetary losses. Sadness, pain, and suffering are non-monetary losses for which monetary compensation is ineffective and insufficient. Monetary compensation for relatives of, or for personal injury victims seeking recognition, an apology, or closure or disclosure is suboptimal sub -optimal at best as the values of dignity and identity are incommensurable with the value of money. No monetary value will remedy or compensate for the loss of a relative or for a temporary or permanent physical or mental impairment wrongfully caused by another person. And with this, we have arrived at the second or last topic of this lecture. Different avenues have been explored to solve the mismatch between what victims need and what they can obtain in tort law, and to possibly overcome the monetary focus. Steps that have already been taken, in addition to common mediation or alternative dispute resolution approaches, int include the introduction of compensation schemes such as the one developed for victims of priest abuse, apology laws, court-ordered apologies, and open disclosure programs. Due to time constraints, I will focus on the latter two. In the written version, information also can be found on apology laws. An alternative for non-monetary relief is to introduce remedies which allows, allow victims to claim specific types of relief and courts to order them. Such a remedy may entail that an adjudicator may order the defendant to give an apology. An example of such a remedy is provided on the screen. In a recent article, as was already said, I conceptualized the ordered apology. It was proposed that a court order apology is primarily a fulfillment of a legal requirement that is not necessarily aimed at psychological healing. The same research found, as was already said, that contrary to conventional wisdom, an apology does not need to be sincere in order for it to be effective. Empirical research in the field of psychology and in the field of law indicate that sincerity can be important to the person receiving the apology, but that ordered apologies can also be important, sometimes equally or even more important than sincere or voluntarily, voluntarily offered apologies. The humiliation of having to provide an apology, the power of a victim to accept or reject an apology, and the recognition and validation that accompany a court-ordered apology can positively affect the well-being of the receiver of the apology. Furthermore, and interestingly, empirical research suggests that an ordered apology does not need to be enforceable in order for it to be effective. In fact, 
Research indicates that ordered apologies without a penalty in case of non-performance are valued more than enforceable apologies. Altogether, the insights call for a perhaps more welcoming approach regarding court-ordered apologies. Perhaps the most rigorous initiative to close the gap between what tort victims pursue and what they can obtain in tort law are open disclosure programs. These programs, which are particularly applied in the medical field, are intended to provide all relevant information to patients who are wronged, or to their relatives, after an adverse medical event. Open disclosure generally includes information about what happened and why, an admission of fault, and an apology. Consequently, open disclosure programs depart from the adversarial model that is commonly found in the legal domain. Importantly, research has reported various positive effects of open disclosure programs, which I discuss more in the written version. Nevertheless, despite the existence, implementation, and success of open disclosure programs, disclosure of medical errors is still limited. Several causes have been identified which explain that limited disclosure, not knowing how to disclose, a lack of institutional report support, the lack of patient willingness to really hear about the error, and the doctor's fear of legal action. Consequently, implementation clearly goes beyond regulation. It is not only about building a legal infrastructure, but also about how to use that infrastructure. The mismatch between what tort victims pursue and what they can obtain shows tort law's limitations in addressing victims' needs. When the law is not capable of solving the problems, there are two possibilities. One, to conclude that the problem is not a legal problem or not a problem to be addressed by the law. Or two, change the notion of law so that it, in its revised form, it is capable of solving the problem. And when exploring the latter option, important challenges emerge regarding the dominance of the monetary perspective and the mismatch between what tort victims pursue and what they can obtain under tort law. The challenges can be observed on various levels. At the normative level, questions arise as to how tort law can be modified in order to solve the mismatch. One possibility is to change how the concept of damages is defined and applied. Damages are commonly determined and calculated by means of the difference hypothese or the difference theory. In this way, the situation the victim is in is compared with the situation the victim would have been in had the injustice or the event not occurred. As a result, applying this difference test can cause tension when a plaintiff sees, seeks non monetary relief, such as an apology, disclosure, or recognition, as such relief does not put the victim back in the situation he would have been in had the injustice not occurred. Instead, a forward looking test that looks at the opportunities and possibilities or capabilities that the victim still has in terms of personal autonomy might be a more suitable test in such instances than the backward looking test. A forward-looking test would need to ask, what does the victim need to lead a life with opportunities to develop him or herself? Developing such a forward-looking test is challenging as it requires a different reference point. If it is not the would-be would -be victim that serves as a point of reference, which hypothetical victim does? And how does such a forward-looking test relate to the current difference test? A forward-looking test also triggers the question of whether existing duties should be expanded. Duties to inform, duties to warn, and duties to care mostly focus on pre-harm or the pre-harm period. A duty to inform, for example, is commonly imposed on a person to prevent certain harm or losses. After-harm duties are less common, but possibly desirable to accommodate other needs than financial ones. Would it be preferable to have remedies that include a duty to apologize, a duty to acknowledge, or, or wrong, or a duty to disclose? If so, what should such duties entail, and what should happen if such a duty is violated? After harm duties are uncommon and perhaps unprecedented, but worth exploring. Research should pose the question of whether procedures and remedies should be modified in order for tort law to improve the facilitation of victims' needs, and if so, how? My research on priest abuse cases suggests that it is possible to make such changes. My study on court-ordered apologies has revealed that even 
Ordered apologies can serve important purposes for victims and society as a whole. In addition, evidence from open disclosure programs suggests that openness after an adverse event, which includes an admission of fault, an apology, and measures to prevent future wrongdoing, uh, can also truly help compensate victims and to achieve a prevention other than through monetary measures. Is it possible to create a tort law based on similar principles? As empirical research in the medical field has demonstrated and was confirmed in the study on priest abuse cases, answering this question may require a holistic approach that not only includes the change of rules, laws, and remedies, but that also requires a change of mentality through education, training, and openness. Furthermore, questions arise at the European level. The European Convention on Human Rights and the European Court of Human Rights are important vehicles for creating a legal infrastructure that allows the mismatch between what victims pursue and what they can obtain in ordinary tort law to be remedied. The European Convention on Human Rights contains several provisions, provisions that could assist in the harmonization and integration of tort law where it comes to non-monetary needs. The European Court has already, albeit carefully, paved the way for court-ordered apologies Moreover, it has given the victim standing and has found violations of Article 13, the right to an effective remedy, in instances where relatives were denied a claim by the domestic courts to hold someone responsible or liable after an injustice. Nevertheless, the potential of the right to an effective remedy, Article 13, seems to be restricted by the monetary focus of the concept of just satisfaction, Article 41. As explained earlier, the practice directions give a rather narrow interpretation of the concept of just satisfaction. Perhaps Article 41 on just satisfaction itself is not an effective remedy. What if Article 41 also allowed the European Court of Human Rights, like the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, to award non-monetary relief, including an apology, information about what happened, an explanation, or even a statute for the victim? What, such an, what would such an approach result in, and how would it shape domestic law? At a more fundamental level, questions arise with respect to how a tort law could be justified that is not dominated by the monetary perspective, that provides more opportunities for including non-monetary needs and relief, and it is also forward-looking. Existing theories such as corrective and distributive justice, like tort law itself, have a strong monetary focus. The current concepts of damages and repair are derived from corrective justice. Are these theories, corrective and distributive justice, reconcilable with a tort law that is more welcoming to non-monetary needs? At the empirical level, what should be analyzed is what a future-oriented criterion for assessing damages may look like. In practice, some insurers and medical experts have been promoting and applying a recovery-oriented approach that focuses on the needs of the victim regardless of, for example, causality issues. It would be interesting to explore and identify different types of such need-based approaches and to examine their effectiveness. Do these different approaches have an effect on how well or how quickly victims recover and on the amount of damages paid to the victim? Addressing non-monetary needs can be complicated. Such needs are highly personal, making it difficult to detect them and to provide adequate relief. The priest abuse study suggests that the practices of the adjudicators differed and that some practices were more successful at resulting in non-monetary relief, such as an apology, than others. An interview study should reveal which differences explain and to what extent adjudicators are willing and able to provide non-monetary relief. This knowledge could provide valuable input for shaping the application of tort law and how to overcome the monetary focus. But non-monetary relief is not all roses. It also has downsides. It has been argued that providing non-monetary relief prior to the decision is detrimental to the apologizer's case, as it may be seen as an admission of fault, consequently establishing liability. Is providing non-monetary relief, such as an apology prior to the decision to, of the court, actually detrimental to one's case? Does this mean that victims will claim more frequently after having received an apology, or less frequently? 
Research on open disclosure programs in the medical field suggests the latter, less frequently, but more empirical research needs to be gathered. Answers to these questions may provide building blocks for alternative procedures, such as the procedure for victims of priest abuse. In baseball, various statistics were developed, but many did not make their way onto the field for a period of time as managers and coaches controlled the on-field decisions. The situation may be similar in the legal field where researchers and practitioners lack an empirical perspective and the tools to conduct, interpret, and assess empirical research methodology. I will try to build more or better bridges between doctrinal legal, or doctrinal legal research and empirical legal research. In my future work, I also hope to continue applying novel methodologies, techniques, and technologies to legal issues, for example, with respect to the issue of non-monetary needs in tort law, in a way that the legal community is able to use and understand. With these final remarks, I arrive at the trickiest part of this lecture, the acknowledgement section. It is the trickiest part as some who hope to be mentioned may not be mentioned. <laughs> My, of course, apologies for this. <laughs> Although many have contributed to me standing here today, it is not doable to mention everybody. I can only thank some of you here. From my former university, Jan Franke, who unfortunately could not be here, but said who would be watching through the live stream, so Jan, you better be watching now and listening. Jan, you were not only the, one of my supervisors, but also a role model. From you, I have learned how important it is to be curious and open to different and new approaches. The sparkle in your eyes reveals the curiosity and openness. Rob van Gestel, who I was told was, was here, ah, I see him. Rob, taking criticism is not my best quality. Providing criticism is one of your better qualities. <laughs> but what you always say, what you say always comes from a good place, and more importantly, always holds value. You continuously challenged me to develop and sharpen my research ideas, and this has been invaluable to me and to my development. It is an important reason why I stand here today. From Maastricht University, I thank the university's executive board and the dean of the faculty. As to the dean, I prefer to, hold, to call you Hildegard, as the informal and personal approach fits the warm welcome you have provided me from the first day here. Appreciation also goes to my colleagues in and outside the Maastricht Law Faculty, particularly my colleagues of the private law department. Together with you, I hope to spark students' curiosity and to guide them through their journey while continuing ours. Chef Van Eyck, I cannot thank you enough for your warmness, encouragement, and trust in me. I enjoy our talks about what we are working on. Your approach to property law is fascinating, <coughs> and your error miles equally impressive. Mika Olatz, we were here last week for your inaugural lecture. Where are you, Mika? Ah, there we go. We also recently stood at a PhD gathering with the main purpose getting free drinks and food, not very professor-like behavior. We are probably rustier than the young kids we think we are, but you do not give me that impression. I'm looking forward to further collaborating with you, for example, by supervising Ruben Hollemans and by getting more free drinks and food. Jan Smits, I see the same sparkle in your eyes as with the Jan I just mentioned. Must be the name. I also see similar traits. You're also a true researcher. In this short time, I've already learned a lot from you regarding the value of diversity and regarding your ability to surround yourself by a group of loyal and extremely talented individuals. I'm happy you will become the dean of the faculty, less happy that you will no longer be the head of the department. Harry, my father. You once asked, why should I thank you? I thought that was a good question. Why should I thank you? You said yourself that it was me who made the decisions and who took the path that I chose. But when drafting this acknowledgement section, I realized that why I am here today is because I did something I believed in, even though others did not, disagreed with, or even condemned. 
The ability to trust myself and give a try to things I believe in is the most important reason I stand here today. I learned that from you and from Ria, who unfortunately is no longer with us, but who I'm sure would express her proudness to me by stating that this lecture was nice, but not very practical. <laughs> Nicole, the word sparkle also applies to you, but in a slightly different meaning. Sparkle is the name you have in mind for the dog you want to get. I am not yet a fan. It would, however, not be the first time that you give me a different perspective on things. Please continue doing that, but don't get your hopes up about Sparkle. Ik heb gezegd. Thank you very much, Professor van Dijk Gijs. We are all quite informal here in Maastricht for a fascinating lecture. You said finally over, luckily, but I don't agree with you. But that will not surprise you, knowing also my background. This does bring us to the end of this formal traditional ceremony. And we will now all go to the uh, reception area where Gijs and his wife We'll hold a reception with free drinks and free food, maybe, if you're, if you're lucky. Thank you all for coming to Maastricht. I hope you have a wonderful evening, or for those of you who stay for the weekend, because many people do that, because it's so far. Enjoy your weekend. And this is the end of our ceremony, and I now have a hammer with which I will close it. Thank you. Thank you.